In the name of the Father, <coughs> the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you believe in miracles? Or would that mean believing in magic? What's the difference between magic and miracle? What exactly is a miracle? You know, one of the most successful magic acts in Las Vegas was a duo called Penn and Teller. If memory serves, they were in the end of a James Bond film with Roger Moore trying to assassinate him while he was busy trying to seduce someone. In one of their most famous tricks, Penn and Teller used to simultaneously fire a gun at each other on stage. Um, oh yeah, you think, well, that, that's easy to stage, isn't it? Because, um, you know, if we did that, we could fix it. But what they used to do was get someone from the audience to put a mark, a secret mark on the bullet. So when, when they picked the bullet out of the mouth, they had the mark on. They would catch the bullet, you see, in each other's mouths. Now, is Jesus a kind of magician then, like Penn and Teller? Is one of his most famous tricks not catching a bullet, but turning water into wine? No, brothers and sisters, no. What happened to Cana wasn't a trick and it wasn't magic. It was a miracle. And a miracle is something completely different from magic. Magicians try and overpower something or someone who's unwilling to obey. For example, by putting a curse on someone. People fear magicians. You know, I've just come back from Africa. I heard about magicians there a couple of times. They use things called fetishes, which are quite sinister. Such magicians try and break the laws of nature made by the creator, and they do it to harm people very often. Now, a miracle is something very different. A miracle is a moment, you could say, when the harmony destroyed by human sin is restored. It may be a moment, maybe the beginning of a whole life, a harmony between God and man, a harmony between the created world and its creator, a restoration of what should always be, not a breaking of God's laws, but a restoration of harmony with God's laws. Not about breaking the laws of nature, but about fulfilling them. A miracle is a moment, you could say, when God enters into his creation and is received. And because he's received, he can act freely. Now, the story we've heard in the gospel, the story of the marriage at Cana in Galilee, is an example of this. When the mother of God turned to Christ and said to him, they have no wine. The hearts of those families and their guests were hungry, thirsting for human happiness, for human joy. And yet, the material support of that joy is gone. They had no more wine. Christ says to her, his mother, what have I to do with thee? Why are you asking me this question? And she doesn't answer him directly. You remember, she turns to the servants and she says, whatever he may say to you, do it. She offers him a perfect act of faith, unreservedly. She trusts his wisdom, his love, his divinity. And at that moment, because a door has been opened by the faith of one person, the kingdom of God is established on this earth. A new dimension of eternity, of infinite depth, enters the world. And what's otherwise impossible becomes a reality. Now, for this harmony to be re-established, on the one hand, there must be a need. What needs could you bring to Jesus? Do you know your deepest needs, your most real needs? Because it would need to be a need that's real. It may not be great, but it must be true. And joy and sorrow, illness and unhappiness are equally a need. Our whole lives are in need of being absorbed into something greater, something vast, something deep, the divine love, the divine harmony. So on the one hand, there must be need. And then, on the other hand, there is the divine love. So Matthew writes that when he saw the crowds, Jesus had compassion for them. Jesus had compassion. That's how he sees you. He sees you, he looks at you, and he has compassion. Such compassion. He looked at people who were in need, people who couldn't do anything to alleviate it. And he felt pain in his heart, the divine heart, that these people whose life should be fulfillment and abundance and joy and glory, that these people should be deprived of joy. 
and instead should be an obvious need. In the gospel today, it's because they had no wine. Another time it's hunger. Another time it's illness. Another time it's sin. And another time it's death. Maybe anything. But God's joy may love may be joy, exalting, glorious joy, a crucified sacrificial pain. When all this meets, then a mysterious harmony is established between the divine sorrow and human need, between human helplessness and the power of God, the love of God that expresses itself in so many ways in our lives, great and small. So brothers and sisters, I think what we need to do is learn to be pure enough in heart, pure enough in mind, to be able to turn to God with our need, without trying to hide it, whatever it is. Or if we feel unworthy coming up to him, let us kneel at his feet and say, Lord, I am unworthy, unworthy to be in your presence, unworthy of being loved, unworthy of your compassion. And yet I believe in your love. And I'm more certain of your love than I am of my own unworthiness. And so I come. In the words of the hymn, words you'll know, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come to you, Lord, because you are love and victory, because I have evidence in the life and death of your only begotten Son, of what I mean to you, the life, the passion, the death, the descent into hell, the horror of it. You went through all that to save me. So brothers and sisters, let us learn a kind of creative helplessness as Christians. God can do what we cannot. So let us be helpless in the sense of being transparent, being supple, listening with all our being, presenting our need to God, our need for eternal life, but also our ordinary needs, needs that are human, the needs of our frailty, the need for support, the need for consolation, the need for mercy. And I promise you, the response of God will always be the same. If you can believe, however little your faith is, everything is possible. And he will reveal his glory. Amen.